One of the most iconic animals of the Pleistocene fauna were the saber-toothed animals, large felids with huge, curved canines. These animals were predators that were at the top of the food chain in their habitats, and today they inhabit the popular imagination. But before we talk about this animal, if you are new to the channel and want to stay up to date with everything that happens in the animal world, subscribe and leave a like. And without further ado, let's get to the video. Although these felines are the first thing we think of when we hear saber-toothed, this term can be applied to any animal that has extremely long canines. One of the oldest saber-tooths is Tyrajudens, a herbivore that lived in Brazil during the Permian, 265 million years ago. This animal had relatively strong tusks that were equivalent to 120% of the height of its skull. But if they didn't use them to hunt other animals, what was the function of these huge teeth? One possibility is that they used these tusks to defend themselves from predators. Another possibility is that he used them in the same way as current saber-toothed herbivores. As in the case of the musk deer, Moscus, which uses its tusks for intraspecific competition, males have very elongated canines and during the mating season, they display their tusks to ward off other males, and if that doesn't work, they attack by scraping teeth into the other animal's body until one of them gives up. For thousands of years this characteristic was quite common, and several groups develop saber teeth independently. Not just deer, but lemurs, baboons, and even a species of salmon have featured these extremely large canines. Among carnivorous mammals, this trait has developed independently at least four or five times. One of these mammals was Thylacosmolus, known as the saber-toothed marsupial, which lived in South America during the Pliocene, 5.3 to 2.5 ma, and became extinct about 2 million years ago. It could weigh between 80 and 120 kilograms and reach 2m in length. Its mouth had a 90 degrees opening, and the canines continued to grow throughout the animal's life. But despite the impressive canines, biomechanical analyzes and the wear pattern of the teeth show that Thylacosmolus did not use them to kill prey, but to open carcasses, and may have had a specialized diet on internal organs. However, it is within Feliformia that we find those animals that come to mind when we think of saber-toothed animals, even if they are not necessarily felines. This is the case of Nimravids and Barbarophelids, known as false saber-toothed, which despite having quite real teeth, and quite large in some cases, are considered false because they do not belong to the group of felids. Saber-toothed. Nimravids appeared in the Eocene, around 40 ma, and disappeared at the Oligocene-Miocene boundary, 23 ma. These animals were so similar to felids that for a long time they were considered as a subfamily of the group but more detailed studies showed that their similarities were only superficial. Barbarophelids lived during the Miocene, 23 to 5.3 ma, and some members of the group, such as Barbarophelis, had a very unique appearance, with long bony extensions in the jaw into which the canines could fit. False saber-tooths lived in Africa, Eurasia and North America. But the so-called true saber-tooths are animals belonging to the Macarodontini group, which includes Homotherium and Smilodon. The group had its origins in Africa, between the early and middle Miocene, 
and during the late Miocene they had already spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere. One of the first of these true saber-tooths was Macaridus. It had long, serrated canines, and its most distinguishing feature was its long, muscular neck. Another genus to emerge in the Miocene was Promagantirian. It was smaller than Macaridus, about the size of a leopard, and its teeth were also shorter. The two animals coexisted, and both are found in Cerro de los Batalones, in Spain. This site is made up of cavities formed in the late Miocene that functioned as natural fauna traps. These cavities could contain water even in periods of severe drought, and attracted by the water, animals entered or ended up falling in there, but were unable to get out. Their carcasses attracted carnivores, which also ended up trapped. This type of event in the fossil record is quite unique, and the large number of fossils preserved in these traps allows a more complete look at the paleoecological conditions of the region. Another interesting characteristic of sabertooths is their way of life. The vast majority of felines we know are solitary hunters, with the exception of lions. Many saber-tooths may have benefited from group behavior, but the diversity of species and groups that develop this trait independently means that their ways of life were equally diverse. It is likely that smaller felid species and those living in dense forest habitats were solitary hunters, like most of their closest living relatives. But for large animals that live in savanna environments, where visibility increases aggression among potential competitors, forming groups is a good survival strategy. Amphimicaridus, Homotherium, and Smilodon were large predators that could have benefited from forming groups. However, just because something is advantageous does not mean that it will certainly occur. And this alone is not enough to state that these animals lived in groups. But for Smilodon there is more evidence of group behavior. S. Fatali's fossils are abundant at Rancho La Brea, another example of a fauna trap, and a study that compares the number of fossil specimens with the structure of the ecosystems we know today shows which are generally species of carnivores that live in groups and dominate situations where there is a lot of competition for prey, such as lions and hyenas. The La Brea region would have been competitive, and the most abundant carnivore species are Smilodon and Canis dyrus, pointing to possible herding behavior of the two. Homotherium also appears to have been a social species, although much of the record is made up of isolated bones and teeth. In Texas, USA, in the location known as Friesenhahn Cave, fossils of at least 30 individuals of varying ages were found, including offspring. Fossils of 70 juvenile proboscideans were also found in the same location with signs of predation, transport, and consumption by Homotherium, showing that it was an extremely specialized hunter. Homotherium and Smilodon made their way to South America during the Great American Fauna Exchange, about three ma ago. Mitochondrial DNA analysis shows that these animals diverged around 18 ma and one of the most notable differences between the two are their sabers. Homotherium's teeth are more curved, resembling a scimitar, while Smilodon has straighter teeth, resembling a dagger. Homotherium was the smaller of the two, although it was a large animal measuring about three feet tall at the shoulder. But the largest, most recent, and arguably most famous of the saber-toothed creatures was Smilodon. The genus was named by Peter Lund in 1842,
based on fossils found here in Brazil, in caves in Lagoa Santa, Minas Gerais. Impressed by the size of the teeth, which can reach 28 centimeters in length, he named the species S. Populator, meaning, one who brings devastation. This animal, which could weigh 400 kilograms, had great success in South America, becoming one of the great Pleistocene predators in the region. Fossils of S. Populator were also found in several Brazilian states, such as Sao Paulo, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Piauí, Sergipe, Rio Grande do Norte, Bahia and Rio Grande do Sul. This animal probably inhabited the Cerrado and Pampa Primitive, where it hunted animals such as macroquinias and ground sloths, in addition to living with other large predators such as the canid protocyon and the jaguar, Panthera anca.